Hello, my name is Shahya Shahyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on introductory combinatorics based on my book, An Invitation to Combinatorics. The topic of this lecture is integer partitions. Let's say you have seven identical balls. How many ways can you put them into two non-empty piles? For example, you can put a, six of them in one pile and one of them in another pile. The way I would like to show those, as is common in combinatorics, is to write the six as one row and the one as a separate row. This is the partitioning of seven identical balls into six and one, a pile of six and a pile of one. The piles are indistinguishable from each other in the sense that there's no first and second pile. They're just piles. I could also put them in five and two or four and three. The number of partitions of seven into two non-empty parts is three. And the way we write that is P of seven sub two partitions of seven into two parts is three. In general, P of n sub k is the number of partitions of the integer n into k parts. And P of n is the total number of partitions of n into any number of parts. n and k are non-negative integers. A partition of n with k parts is a sequence of k positive integers such that they add up to n. Because the order of them doesn't matter, we will always write them in a weakly decreasing order. So the biggest one first, and then keep putting the smaller ones as we go along with ties allowed. That's why I say weakly decreasing, non-increasing way. These integers are called the parts of the partition. Lambda is lambda 1, lambda 2, or lambda k, and that's a partition of n. The way we write that is lambda with this notation, a vertical line and then a line across, and we read that lambda is a partition of n. Sometimes in arguments, you might have to augment lambda with zeros. In our definition, none of the parts can be zero, but sometimes in proofs, you might need to do that. And if you do, that's still the same partition. For n greater than zero, p of n sub k is going to be the number of partitions of n with k parts, and p of n is going to be total number of partitions of n, regardless of the number of parts. Now, p of zero sub zero will define to be one, and p of zero sub k for all k greater than zero is going to be zero. Of course, if you have zero balls, and if you want to put it in k non-empty parts, then there's no way to do that. But also, if you have no balls and no parts, we call that one. As a result, p of zero is going to be one. So let's look at an example. What's the number of partitions of four into two parts? The only ways you can do that is to do three and one, and then two and two. And so p of four sub two is two. Now, if you look at all partitions of four, you have the partition four when you put everything in just one pile. When I put all those dots in one row, that's just one pile. Or you could have 3, 1, or 2, 2, the ones we discussed before. You can have 2, 1, 1, or you can have four parts, each of them having one. Five different partitions of four. The number of partitions of four into one part is one. The number of partitions of four in two parts is two. The number of partitions of four in three and four parts are one. And in zero parts is zero, and in five parts, it's also zero. You might be familiar with Stirling numbers, and you might wonder the relationship between these two. The number of partitions of four into two parts is two, but partitioning a set of elements into two parts, there's seven ways you can do that. So this brace for two and the Stirling number of second type counts the number of partitions, but not of the integer four, but of the set with four distinct elements. These are distinct elements and you want to put them in two parts. For example, if you partition them into one, two, and three, four, versus one, four, and three, two, three, those are two different partitions. Whereas when you're partitioning the integer four into two plus two, there's just one way of doing it. Whereas partitioning a set of four elements into two subsets of size two, you can do it in multiple different ways. That's why the number of partitions of a set of size four into two elements is seven, whereas the number of partitions of the integer four into two parts is only two. If you don't know what Stirling numbers are, watch one of my videos on Stirling numbers or just ignore that comment. So now let's look at some easy cases. If n is a positive integer, then the only way to partition it into one part is to put everything together. If you want to partition n into n parts, there's only one way to do it, because all you can do is put all your balls into separate piles. If you want to partition the integer n into n minus one parts, then the only way, again, you can do that is to have one pile of size two and all the other piles of size one. There's no other way of doing it. Given that, we can come up with the small values of these partition numbers. But as soon as we get a little bit further on, it will, will be a little bit more complicated to calculate and you would have to do more work. 
as in many other combinatorics problems, you can also think of a, a balls and boxes problem, a problem where you're putting balls in boxes as a way of thinking about these partition numbers. You have S identical balls and T identical boxes. The balls are all identical, so it doesn't matter which ones you put in which box, and the boxes are identical. You're putting your balls into piles. As long as you assume that no box remains empty, then the number of ways of placing the balls in the boxes is going to be the number of partitions of S into T parts. You have, now, if you have S identical balls and T identical boxes and want to put the balls in the boxes, but you want to allow empty boxes, then the total number would be the sum of these because you might use T non-empty boxes. The number of ways you can place your S balls into T non-empty boxes if P of S sub T, or you might use T minus one non-empty boxes. And the total number of ways of doing that would be P of S sub T minus one and so forth, all the way till putting all, all S balls in one pile. I also have putting all S balls in zero piles, and that's usually zero. The only time it's not zero is if S is also zero. And to make this correct in general, we add that one term as well. If the balls were distinct, then the answers would be in terms of Stirling numbers. If you don't know about Stirling numbers, watch my videos on Stirling numbers or just ignore this comment. Placing S distinct balls in T identical boxes, so that would mean you have S distinct things that you're trying to partition. That's exactly what the definition of S brace T is. And if you were allowed the boxes to be empty, you would get a sum of the Stirling numbers. To calculate the partition numbers, like many other combinatorial counting problems, we try to come up with a recurrence relation. Coming up with a recurrence relation for P of n, for the total number, is actually not straightforward. Of course, if you have a recurrence relation for partitioning n into k parts, you can add those and get something for P of n. But getting a nice recurrence relation for P of n is not that easy. There's one very nice one called the Euler's pentagonal number that we will not cover in this lecture, maybe hopefully in a future lecture. But for partitioning n into k parts, we can come up with a nice recurrence relation. To come up with a recurrence relation, you come up with a thought experiment. And I'm gonna go through the thought experiment before I tell you what the recurrence relation is. We have two positive integers, n and k, and n is greater or equal to k. We want num the number of partitions of n into k parts. Lambda one, lambda two, lambda k, that's one partition of n, and we wanna count how many of them are there. We know that these guys add up to n, and they are non-increasing. So they're weakly decreasing, they're going down, but with ties involved. Script A, among these partitions, the ones we want to count, is going to be all the ones for which lambda k, the last one, the smallest one is one. And B is going to be the partitions where that last one is bigger than one. All partitions of N are going to be one of these categories. Either the last part is going to have just one thing in it, or the last part is going to have more. Now, if you look at the ones that the last one is just one, what happens if you take that ball away, that one away? If you do that, then you get a partition of n minus one things into k minus one non-empty parts. And in fact, vice versa, if you take a partition of n minus one things into k minus one parts and add a new pile with just one element, you will get a partition of n into k parts where the smallest part is just one. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between partitions of n where lambda k is one and partitions of n minus one into k minus one parts. And so the size of A is the same as P of N minus one sub K minus one. What about script B? Script B is all those partitions we haven't counted. The ones that have their last part bigger than one. For those, we do a different thing. What we do is that we say, okay, all of these guys, all the parts have more than one element because the smallest one has more than one element. All of them must have more than one element. So just take one off each of them. And if you do that, then you will get a partition of N minus K because you took K things out into K parts. And that gives us a bijection. So if you have a partition of n into k parts, but the last part is greater than one, just take one off of each of the parts and you will get a partition of n minus k into k parts. Vice versa, if you have a partition of n minus k into k parts, just add to one to each one of the parts and you will get a partition of n into k parts, but one where that smallest part has size at least two. These two maps are inverses of each other and therefore both of them are one to one and onto. They're bijections and the, so the size of B is the same as P of N minus K sub K. And because of that, now I have the, the recurrence relation that I want because all partitions of N into K parts are of one of two types. Either the last part is one, in which case the number of those is the same as partitions of N minus one into K minus one parts, or the last one is bigger than one, in which case the number of them is the same as partitions of n minus k into k parts. I'm now going to give you a second recurrence relation. 
Let's say that N and K are positive integers with N greater or equal to K. The number of ways of placing N identical balls in K identical boxes, if no boxes remain empty, is P of N sub K. That's the thing that we want to count. But what if we allow empty boxes? If you allow empty boxes, the number is going to be the sum of these. P of n sub k is going to count the number of ways that you can partition into k things with known empty boxes. P of n sub k minus 1 is going to be when you allow one empty box, k minus 1 non-empty boxes, and so forth. If you allow empty boxes, this is going to be your total sum. Now, if no boxes is empty, that's the case we wanted to count, place one ball in each box. You have these identical balls and you want to partition it into k parts and you want none of the parts to be empty. So we'll put one of the balls in each box. At that point, what you will have is that n minus k balls remain. And you have to distribute them. And now you don't have to distribute them into k parts. You could also leave some of them empty. You need to distribute these n minus k balls, but in any way you want among those k parts, even if some of them are empty. And so if you want to place them in k boxes, allowing empty boxes, you get the number of partitions of n minus k into k parts, the number of partitions of n minus k into k minus one parts, the number of partitions of n minus k into k minus two parts, all the way till partitions of n minus k into zero parts. The sum of those then will be p of n sub k. And as a result, you get this second recurrence relation. Using that, we can actually fill out our uh, table as far as we want. So for example, the number of partitions of 10 into four parts down here, that's a nine. Why is that nine? Because of our recurrence relation, that's going to be this seven, that's P of N minus one sub K minus one, plus what? Plus P of N minus K sub K. Now K is the same column, but I've got to go further up in that column. How far? This is uh, row 10, column four, 10 minus four is six. So I have to go all the way to row six. So I get to that two. So that's seven plus two is nine. Our second relation said that what I can do is instead of that seven, I can just add everything in that same row, that row n minus k, row six, starting with two going back down. So two plus three plus three plus one is also nine. Or for example, the seven is six plus that one, because this is a row 10, column five, and 10 minus five is five, so I have to go to row five. So that six plus one is giving me that seven, or alternatively, one plus one plus two plus two plus one plus zero gives me seven. This table has lots of properties that are not obvious at all. For example, the Indian mathematician Ramanujan proved the following thing, which is actually not an easy thing to prove. He proved that if you go to a row where the remainder of the row number when divided by five is four. So for example, four and nine, if you go there, and then they look at P of N, the total number, uh, in this case, five and 30, he proved that you will always get a number divisible by five. Now, now I challenge you to try to see why that might be true. I doubt you'll be able to figure it out. Partition numbers are used in many different places. For example, in representation theory of the symmetric group, they come up quite often because the number of conjugacy classes of Sn, the symmetric group on n letters, is exactly the same as P of n. The number of irreducible representations is the same, and there's actually a one-to-one -one correspondence between partitions of n and the irreducible representations of Sn, and that becomes very important. In the next lecture, we will see one method looking at these things called Ferrer's diagrams or Young diagrams. In a much later lecture, we will look at a generating function approach to partition numbers. This is the end of this lecture. Like my video and subscribe to my channel if you would like to be subjected to math videos in your feed and keep hydrated at all times.